this series, we're connecting to art and culture communities around the world to examine life and work of creative people during the time of coronavirus pandemic. Today, my guest is an international art curator based in Dubai, Mojgan and Javi Barbe. Hello, Mojgan. Hello, Svetlana. Thank you so Thank much for inviting me today. Thank you for joining us. How did the coronavirus pandemic affect Dubai so far? Well, I think that the government of Dubai has been very, very efficient and people have been very law abiding. And uh, we came out of the, we came, we became unlocked, semi unlocked, uh, right uh, after the Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan will finish at the 80s on the 24th of May. And people have been very good. We still have to wear masks when we are in the public places. And uh, when we, whenever we go to public places like supermarket, they take our temperature. But people are really following this very, very well, and they're collaborating, and it has been very good and good and successful here. What effect a current coronavirus pandemic has on artists and art community, in your view? Well, for me, the artists have always worked alone. They haven't, they, you know, for them, I don't think it changes them that much in the working process. Because anyway, they have to work alone at home or in the atelier or uh, place where they work. I think what has affected them is this social distancing and the cultural shutdown. Is art which is produced now different from art which was produced before the lockdown? In other words, how external conditions influence the work of creative people? Very interesting question. You know, I have, because, you know, we are, it's a good question because it brings me to the open call that we're going to uh, make public very, very soon in a few days. The title of this uh, uh, open call is Dubai 2020. The reason I've chosen the name 2020, Dubai 2020, because we were supposed to have Expo 2020, Dubai Expo 2020, but because of Corona, it has been postponed to next year in October. I wanted to keep the, and give a, also a loge to Dubai because I'm a resident of Dubai since 2015, and I wanted to give something back to the community. So with Victoria Arno, my colleague, we are uh, prepared, and some other friends who have joined us other curators who have joined us on this project, we are giving out an open call very soon, in a few days, that the title is called Social Distancing, a Cultural Shutdown and Empty Spaces. And we are, this is for the Middle Eastern artists who are based in Middle East and outside, they can, they can be internationally anywhere, as long as they're Middle Eastern artists and South Asia. And we want to give them an opportunity and also encourage them and we have made it the competition and the, this competition will be for a month, month and a half. We would receive their work from all over the world and then we will have an international jury of curators and art historians who will choose the best 10 uh, artists and will give them a prize. This exhibition will be uh, digital first because of the social distancing. And also this allows us, which I'm very happy in a sense that we can now finally connect to the world and you know we don't have to be low glo i mean it's global now it's not local anymore and then hopefully by september or by fall this year if things are under control then we will have a, a physical exhibition and uh, one i contacted one of the artists who's in kuwait and she said to me i'm glad that she asked me she told me that she was glad that i contacted her because because of well, the coronavirus she's just hasn't worked and she said she hasn't touched the brush and she said you know what i'm thinking about what i'm going to do first i think i'm going to write and she said i think i'm going to uh, for me it's the, the focal or the lower the purpose or the the center of my paint uh, exhibition or painting will be a chair i think the, this chair for me is very symbolic because she's waiting and you know i know her she's very vigorous very energetic and I think this call, open call, has given her the encouragement and made her want to get up and work again. So I'm happy in a sense that this open call that we're going to release in a few days is going to be encouragement for a lot of artists because, you know, the thing is artists have to work. They have to live and also they need an audience. And now with all these changes, Everybody has been under the shock and they, nobody knows what to do. But I think slowly we're going to 
adopt to a new system that, okay, there will be social distancing. We're going to have more digital. Everything is going to be more digital. And we have to learn how to live with these new rules. This is a fantastic initiative. Uh, where can our audience, uh, our viewers, learn more about it? We will put it online. We will put it online and we make sure everybody gets it because we will, it will be on Facebook, it will be on Instagram. And then we also have all the information that is related to this open call connected all as well through a, a PDF. So, and then we will be very happy to give you also one so you can put it on the same link as this interview. This is great. We will then provide a link to, uh, with information and we will attach this information to this video on YouTube uh, as well as on social media where we're going to announce this interview coming. Let's talk about Iranian art and Iranian artists. Uh, but before that, I would like to talk a little bit about you. You were born in Iran and at the age of 18, you went to the US for study. And uh, at that time, the war with Iran started, which actually uh, cut you from your family for five years. Uh, since then, you lived in Tokyo, Paris, uh, Geneva, London, and now you're based in Dubai. Um, we met in Geneva at the time when you were promoting Iranian artists. Uh, before that, you did other curating work. Can you tell us about the work which brought you to uh, your projects with Iranian artists? Yes. I was born in a family of culture and literature, so I think it's in my DNA. And uh, even though I studied political science in the U.S. when I went there, I was actually 19 when I left Iran. And after I left, the Iranian revolution happened. And uh, so I couldn't, I mean, I didn't have the social media, I didn't have the WhatsApp, I didn't have the Skype or Zoom at the time. So for a 19-year-old girl to be disconnected from her family was very difficult. And when I, I was studying political science and sociology, and when I had to transfer from the junior college to state university, they told me, you're Iranian, you can't go. So I had to get a social legal aid lawyer, and I, had, I made a class action suit on behalf of all the Iranian students. And I said, you know, I have nothing to do with politics. I'm just here to study. And um, even though I studied political science, but I think my heart has been always with art and culture, because I think art and culture and food are, the connecting bridges between uh, people of the world, regardless of the, their uh, ethnic or language or religion. We're all human. We're just a human, you know, just a global human beings. And it doesn't matter where we are from. Uh, so I came, uh, so I got, after I came back from the United States to see my family in Paris, I met my French husband through my family and we got married. We lived four years in Paris, three years in Tokyo, 10 years in London and 15 years in Geneva. And um, while I was in Geneva, one of my friends who was a collector, Kasha Hildebrand, uh, after she, was a, she, came to London, uh, she came from London to Geneva and she was in finance before, but she decided to uh, have a family and also she wanted to open her first gallery and she asked me to help her so for two years I worked with her as a consultant and we did a very good job and um, I was very happy to be part of the success of Farhad Mashiri who's a very famous Iranian artist one of the most famous Iranian artists we have in our right now in, in contemporary art and uh, so Kasha and I exhibited Kash, uh, uh, Farhat Mashiri and then Kasha from Geneva. She also opened another gallery in Zurich and another uh, gallery in New York. And there he had, she had the sole exhibition for Farhat Mashiri and he really took off and now he's with the most famous galleries all over the world. And we're very proud of that. And we were happy that we could be part of that success. And then after I left Kasha Hildebrand's gallery after two years, because my children were at the age that they really needed my attention, I decided to create two cultural associations. The first one was called ILA in Geneva. And in, with ILA Association, I promoted Iranian culture. We had, uh, we had conferences about the Persian gardens. We had conferences about the Persian old, uh, ancient Persian uh, religions, and also, I, I brought the 
Siabazi, which is the Comité d'Alerte from Iran, and we had 16 uh, players, and I collaborated with Théâtre de Saint-Gervais, and it was very successful. We had a full house for five days. I brought uh, lay, women, uh, uh, women singer who were doing the uh, Sufi chants. The, the group was called is called Rosane, and that was very successful. And then I also brought another Iranian singer, Paris Zangene. So while I was doing this, I realized we need to do something different. And Geneva being city of lake and all the beautiful roses, I thought it would be great if I could take, make the initiative of creating the first Persian garden outside of Iran. So the city of Geneva gave us all the permission, the land, and we worked four years on the Persian garden project, but unfortunately we didn't take off. At the meantime, I was going back and forth to Iran and I realized the Iranian artists don't have the right representation and nobody's showing them the way they should outside of Iran. So I took the initiative and I started working with the Iranian artists, young Iranian artists, and I thought this would be a great way of promoting them. That's when we met Svetlana. And I did uh, two exhibitions with, this, uh, uh, with the support of City of Geneva in the Musée d'Art Contemporain. Uh, and uh, the first exhibition where we met was with three young women and you met them. So uh, that's because I thought they really need somebody because I, they need wind under their, their wings, you know, because they don't speak the language and they don't have any opportunity to come. And I was outside and I could represent their work. Like the work you see behind me is also another of those young artists. Bahid Jafar Nejad, who is such a talented artist. There are so many talented artists, but the world doesn't see them because we do have famous artists like Shirin Nejad, Farhad Mashiri, and many others, but the young promoting, the young uh, promising artists, not many people see them. And I think we need to help those young artists as well to become well known. That's why I decided I need to come in there and put my initiative and help them to come out and show their works. Well, I have to say it was a fantastic project and very well received by people in Geneva because we don't know much about uh, Iranian contemporary art and here not only we were learning about uh, contemporary Iranian art, we were also learning about women artists from Iran. And I remember those three uh, amazing talented women whom you brought, Elnaz Javani, Zahra Hosseini, Mariam Ashkanyan. And I remember how you were saying how difficult it was actually to cross the border with some of this art. And I'm not surprised because it was very strong. And I have to say you were very brave to bring this art from Iran uh, to cross the border. Um, are there any news? Uh, how did this project, this exhibition, helped these three young uh, women? Uh, can you tell us some stories of yeah. today? What are they doing? I don't know, Tsvetlana. Do you remember? They could hardly speak English. I had to translate for all of them. But I think this opportunity, because they were uh, they were sponsored by City of Geneva, and uh, you know we got uh, we got all the cover we could cover all the expenses for the their trip the hotel and everything. And for them, it was just like breath of fresh air to come out of Iran, to be able to see other things, to go to the museum and to see, just not to wear the scarf, <laughs> you know, just, just to be themselves. Actually, it was very cold because it was during the winter. And because they're always used to cover their head, coming to Europe and not covering their head, they were freezing, but they loved it. They loved it. And I can tell you, that I'm so, so proud that the three women, the three women artists, Elnaz Javani, she, they all decided they want to learn English because they need to communicate with the world and they realized to speak Farsi is not enough. So that was a great initiative. So the three of them went back home with strong ideas that we wanted to do something different and we want to learn English and we want to be seen by the world. I'm so proud to say that Zahra Hosseini, she, she, had a, she had a family now and she's teaching in Shiraz. She worked for a long time in Tehran. Now she's teaching and working and her work is, she's doing really well. Mariam Hosseini, um, Mariam Ashkanya, uh, she, she's continued her work. Her work changed completely from the one you bought. 
she became much more audacious in her expression of her artworks. And, you know, sometimes I was wondering, how could she show this in Iran, you know, as you were saying. But she really managed, she had a lot of exhibition after my exhibition outside of Iran, and people are following her. And I even heard that the city in the Caspian area, she even curated and is running a gallery as well besides being an artist. Now, Elna Javani was the most, she was really, really intense from the day one, but I knew that how bright she was. So before she went to the US, she got a grant, $80,000 a year grant with Chicago Art Institute, which I was so proud of her. Before we went to Chicago Art Institute, she got accepted to an art residency in Palma, Mallorca, which was a good transition between Iran and going to the US. <clears throat> So she went after those three months and she had an exhibition, a fantastic uh, show also in Palma, Mallorca before she left. And um, we had the exhibition, the person who was organizing this, she even sold some of her work to very good uh, collectors. Once Elnaz went to the US, to Chicago, she studied there and she was teaching after. And now even I'm so proud to say that she's going to be assistant professor at SIAC, the Chicago Art Institute. She's a Act, she's working as an artist and right now, right after this Corona COVID uh, pro, uh, event, she started making really artistic masks and she's selling it out online, which I thought was very good because I thought, okay, she's so preoccupied doing the mask in a very colorful and artistic way that we forget about all these negative issues of Corona uh, uh, and COVID-19. So I think life goes on and I'm, I was so happy that I could be a tiny, tiny help to these three bright artists to succeed. I think you did amazing work and uh, it, it, it really shows that, you know, you, you planted seeds there and these three women uh, are very inspirational yeah. and I also follow them a little yeah. bit uh, on social media and it's very impressive how much confidence this trip gave them. And uh, I'm sure if people want to learn more about them, they will contact you, uh, we will uh, direct them. But these are amazing, uh, inspirational stories. Uh, today, uh, with coronavirus, uh, how do artists uh, in Iran deal with it? Is it uh, because before they had already some constraints uh, put on them with uh, conditions uh, from uh, U.S. Uh, uh, restrictions. Marvelous. And now there is a new wave, uh, probably, which is affecting them. How do they deal uh, with, uh, with the situation? I think right now the whole world is in such a shock. The whole world is in such a shock, and we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how long it's going to take. And I think Iranians are like all other people in the world. They just have to wait, and they have to adopt. And I think because we've had a revolution and because we had eight years of war with Iraq, and then, you know, like from the, say from January, we started having a lot of things that happened. We had earthquake, we had uh, floods, we had that plane that fell. You know, we've had so much, so much happening to us recently that somehow, I don't know how Iranians manage. I really, I'm amazed and uh, perplexed to see how could our people be so strong and manage this. You know, we've been through a lot, Svetlana, a lot. And, uh, you know, eight years of the world war with Iraq was not easy. I wasn't there, but, you know, like my family and friends said that the, each time there was, a, was bombing, they had to run to those shelters and people were very close to each other because they were such a, in such a difficult situation. So I think people of the Middle East have been through so much, through so much from Lebanon to Iraq to Syria to Iran. We have been through so much in Palestine. We've been through so much that we have, we had, we have a, a self-defense mechanism now because you know, what can we do otherwise? You know, you have to survive. You have to smile, even though it's not, Probably inside you're not smiling, but at least in appearance you're smiling. So I think Iranians are also, the Iranian artists are like everybody else. We have been cut off from the world for 40 years almost, you know, because we've got the American embargo. And, you know, it's, it's been very difficult. It is very difficult. 
but we will survive and the art will continue. I'm very positive about all the good news. Well, this is an amazing uh, insight and I think that's what probably makes Iranian art uh, different. It's, you know, spiritual, it's very strong. There's always a very strong image. Maybe you can say a few words about it. Being an art curator, doing different shows, working with different artists, do you think there is a difference between Iranian art and other art? Um, I don't know if you have ever seen this film, The Life of Others, which is in East Berlin. Um, yes. I think when you work under, when you live in a country where you cannot express yourself, or any society where you cannot express yourself, you have to learn ways. I mean, you're from Russia. You, you've had more of your shares. I think then you learn a survival method of expressing yourself and say things. And I think it becomes because we are desperate to communicate with the world through our art, through our writings, through our poetry. We have to learn to do um, symbolics. The, symbolic, the symbolism comes into a lot to their art, I think, and to the creativity part of the artist in the countries where you don't have uh, the freedom of expression. And I think the Iranian artists have done a great job. I'm so proud of them, you know, when I look. I mean, I'm looking now more to the Middle Eastern and the, like, I'm getting to know more and more of Pakistani artists. They are incredible. It's unbelievable how good they are. It's just not Iran. I think it's the whole Middle East, Southeast Asia. It's unbelievable how much progress we've made and how much, and I think also the social media and internet also has been a great help. Because all the Iranian artists are connected to the world through internet, even though they're disconnected, but they're connected. Well, this is a great way of technology and we should have no excuses, but That's to connect true. to each other without any boundaries or limits, because exactly. we really have everything today to connect and to support each other. That's why we're talking. And that's why for us, I think, and for our viewers, I hope this interview is very interesting. There is another uh, question I wanted to ask you because while in Geneva, as you mentioned, you created a, an association called ILA uh, to promote Iranian culture. That led you to another project, which you realized a few years later in Iran. And I know this project is very close to your heart. Can you tell me about it, please? Yes, when, uh, you know, when we worked for four years on the Persian Garden in Geneva, four years, it was very, it was really an amazing ex uh, project. And because the city helped all of the colleagues who were working, you know, uh, as volunteers, they, we worked together. I spent money personally to make that, uh, you know, just because we had all these expenses we had to pay to get the project ready. And unfortunately it didn't take off. But I think I was being consoled by God, by the energies and the, you know, the, the universe. Going back and forth to Iran and to Shiraz, that's the city of my father, and that's the city of Hafez and Persopolis and Saadi, the great poets, and the roses. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to buy old historic homes to create a museum for my uncle, who's done an amazing job about the, for the, the um, Verb, uh, the uh, verbal culture of Iran, because in Iran, our culture, it's verbal. And my uncle has been 30 years, like Hans Christian Andersen, and he collected all the verbal culture about, you know, because we have long winters, and also in Iran, being an agricultural society at the time, the grandparents, during the long winter nights, would tell the, all these stories about our culture. So my uncle gathered these stories for many, many years, for 30 years, and he published books. In, in, in his honor, I would have liked, I would, wanted it to do a museum for him in Shiraz. So for two years, I keep going back and forth to Shiraz, looking at all these homes in the bazaar area, which is the center of culture and center of all these historic monuments in Shiraz. And finally, I met, met a friend, a with another friend, and this gentleman, uh, Ahamid Reza Jahanbekam, he helped me to buy the house and restore the houses. Now, one house became 10 houses, several houses, and we managed to restore four of them, and they became, uh, two or three of them have become boutique hotels 
and we have we're very happy to to host the foreign guests who come to Iran and also I use that house also one of the houses for the uh, art residencies for the foreign artists because each, each time a country gives a residency to an Iranian artist who works with me I I invite them to the art residency in Shiraz so the pre so I didn't manage to do the Persian called garden in Geneva but then what did we do we restored historic homes in Shiraz that they were falling apart and we kept it up and now if you come back to see you know, we did this project seven years ago now people who were in Shiraz seven years ago and when they come back they cannot recognize the whole bazaar area has been restored it's fantastic there are a lot of nice cafes people are so people in Shiraz are especially very warm and very welcoming people and Shiraz is reputated has a good reputation in Iran even all the Iranians they love to come to Shiraz and you each time you mentioned Shiraz they have a big smile on their face so we're very happy that this project we started seven years ago also encouraged other people to invest money in these old homes that at the time nobody wanted to be because this area was a bit like Notting Hill Gate in London there were drugs there were this but then after we started this good project everything got cleaned up this whole place is just shining and is prosperous and is got back the life that it deserves. So I'm so happy we did this project and there are other people who are continuing it. And we really reached the goal we wanted to upkeep and preserve this area, which is very good. So uh, this is amazing. And of course, it's uh, you know one of my dreams to go to Shiraz one day. Uh, so basically, if we have uh, artists uh, who are looking for art residencies, residencies or programs or just tourists, they can contact you and come over to, to visit Iran and uh, Shiraz and they will have a local guide, uh, a, a, an ambassador of Iranian culture uh, abroad. Morgan. We have, you would be surprised. We have guys, tourist guys who speak Chinese, Russian, uh, Japanese, English, French, Italian, and Spanish. We have such a bright young uh, guides in Iran and we, everything is organized. And I'm so proud to say that after two years, I managed to convince, because you know, now in Abu Dhabi, we have a Louvre Museum. After two years, I managed to convince the director of this friend of uh, Louvre to bring, when they come to Abu Dhabi, they came this November. We have two groups of 30 people, 30 friends of Les Amis de Louvre, the friends of Louvre who came to Shiraz and they stayed with us. And they had three days only in Shiraz because they had to come back to Abu Dhabi to go back to France. And they loved it and they said, okay, next time when we come, we want to go to Isfahan, we want to go to Kashan, they want to see other parts. And Yazd, which is the Zoroastrian center in Iran. So, Right now, because of the coronavirus, all the traveling and tourism is slowed down. But, you know, corona is not going to be forever. We're going to learn to live with corona and to be careful. So life will go on and we'll be very happy to have you in Shiraz and to book your whole trip uh, to other parts of Iran with the guides, with the driver, with all the uh, you know, connections at the airport. You know, I'm just optimistic. Things are not going to stay this way. Things are going to change. So we have to look at the positive side. And mentioning about the social, about the resident art residency, any country that gives residency to any of the Iranian artists I work with, I would choose, you know, because we always have to choose from the artists who come in. We would be very happy to give them also residency for a time they need in Shiraz. Because also the houses being next to the carpet bazaar, it's just full of inspiration and they would love it because it's just like they're in the right place to feel and to see something that is still like it was before because the bazaar area hasn't changed that much. It has the true you know, the idea of what tourists have about Iran is around that area, not going to a hotel that it, because you, know, you have the best hotels in Western world. But when you go to a restored historic home, you see something of the past. You, you see the water fountain, you have the orange blossoms and the birds and the butterflies, and that takes you to another dimension. 
and what a beautiful uh, place it is. I've seen some photographs before Morgan sent me. These are like fairy tale houses. Uh, you know, I don't, even if you are not an artist, I think you'll get so inspired and you know, your creativity will blossom. Just being surrounded by history, by culture, by beauty, by aesthetics. So uh, thank you so much, Mojgan. I will actually with great pleasure post some of the photos uh, on my social media. Otherwise we will provide a link how you can contact Mojgan uh, in order to discuss uh, some potential trips. And another question I wanted to ask you, we met in Geneva uh, doing some spiritual workshops and I know you are one of those people who pays a lot of attention, does a lot of work on yourself. And I think this is something so valuable at the times of coronavirus when you know we see uh, a lot of negativity, a lot of um, uh, paranoia, pessimism. How uh, do we deal in the times like this and does a spiritual work help you? If it does, how? Maybe you can share some uh, your some of your tricks, some of your advices. I'm so I'm so glad, Svetlana, you asked me this question because this is so close to my heart. As you know, I've been following Sadhguru since 2017. Sadhguru came right before Art Dubai. He came to Dubai to Dubai in 2017 to give a talk, and I have been searching spirituality since I was 40, now I'm 60, so 20 years. And you and I met through that uh, meeting, uh, you know, with that uh, guy. With Kambis. Kambis. And, uh, you know, it was good, but it wasn't the one I was looking for until I was invited to this talk by Sadhguru. When I went in there and he started talking, tears came down my eyes. And I didn't know why. It just, he touched me on the right in the spot. It was exactly the things I had been waiting to hear. So I did my first course, which is Inner Engineering Online, which is right now, is 50% discount. And I really recommend everybody to join this because it changed me. It changed my life in a lot of senses that I realized I have to live consciously, I have to live in presence, and I have, I'm responsible for myself. You know, and you have to love yourself before you can love anybody. So, you know, you have to several uh, steps. And I, you know, being in Dubai, I'm four hours from the ashram to Kumbatur. So I go from Sharjah and, I, you know, now, now I have a one year visa with multiple uh, entry. So I can go anytime. But it has been so enriching. And, I, you know, it was funny. Uh, I, I did my inner engineering online in France during summer in uh, 2017. In November, I went to the ashram to do the Shambhavi and to get initiated. And it was interesting because uh, there was a, I, I stayed for a month just to check this place out and to see who's Sadhguru and make sure this is the right choice. And I was Guru, just just one one just for people to understand who we're talking about. Sadhguru is spiritual teacher. Uh, based in India, he became extremely well known in the last two years. He's invite, he was invited by World Economic Forum this year in Davos. He's talking in Harvard University and many uh, United Nations actually in Geneva where I saw him uh, in uh, just a few months uh, ago in May and uh, June to celebrate the International Yoga Day. Yes, so Mojgan is uh, um, traveling to India, to Ashram, yeah. where Sadhguru is teaching. Yeah, and also we will put the link for Isha Foundation. And so I keep going back and forth. And I just came back right before this. I went there for the, because we know we have inner engineering and we had other process. And the last one, the last one that is taught by Sadhguru seven days, was I went in uh, in February of this year in 2019. I went for uh, for a program that is called um, uh, Mahashivatri, which is the longest night. And after that, we had a seven day silence and meditation with Sadhguru, which is called Samyama. This is the last part of our training. And you know, we were seven days. We were three thousand people, seven days in silence 
and we followed his uh, you know teaching and i think we, he prepared us for us so when for this what happened we didn't know this is going to happen so i came back to dubai on the 14th of march and then three days after i arrived in, in dubai it was shut down here they shut down and everything was locked like everywhere else but we had to stay in. so i think and now, and I needed this because I needed to digest what I learned during seven days. And, you know, every day there's a whole sadhana, all the meditation. I have two and a half hours of meditation and yoga to do. And Sadhguru gave us a, a darshan, which is a gathering every day online for 42 days. He gives us every day a day, daily darshan. And, he to, you know, he guided us. And it was just like we were being followed by our guru and he re i mean it has been amazing for me and i think because of this uh, spiritual process the, the calm in me and this meditation and you know you create certain distance with your body and then also thinking about me 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 all the time i since i've been back i have been fundraising for the people in iran which cannot eat you know they, they are in a very difficult situation so we can provide them with food in India and also in Dubai, we have this project which is 10 million meal. So I think if you go out of yourself and not only think about yourself, I think then you know this whole process of Corona, you don't, you know, it's not like uh, you don't feel as much stress because you're going out helping others and thinking about other people. And I think this is when you feel more calm and you feel more, you know, stay and more within. So I by giving, also, you're receiving a lot. Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. And you know, I, I just, I can tell you, Svetlana, I don't have enough, uh, honestly, with this open call, I'm also advising on another project, which is a very creative group of young people who are, have, are in fashion in here. They're uh, fa fashion stylists, and they do A to Z of photo shooting from, um, you know, clothes and with models and with uh, makeup artists. So I'm all advising them. I'm, we are soon going to give up, give this uh, open call on uh, this uh, open call for Middle Eastern and Southeast Asian artists. No, South Asian artists, and plus all the volunteer work and the fundraising we're doing. So you know, and so and every day also I go for a walk right before the sunset on the on the beach with the mask. <laughs> Wonderful. So this actually gives you a lot of energy, a lot of uh, organization, a lot of projects, a lot of uh, exchange, uh, positive exchange with people. So this spiritual work really helps you to go through, through this time when a lot of people are locked down and actually have uh, what I think is a bit of concern for me is this growing fear. Uh, so sometimes it's taking over and it's, uh, of course, we all agree that fear is a part of protection um, uh, mechanism. We all need it. But at the same time, if it's taken out of proportion, it can have certain consequences on us and on our, you know, our future. So that's a great, great topic to touch upon uh, the um, spirituality. And I hope that we will have a special edition just devoted to that. I think it's a great introduction to the subject by someone who is devoted to the spiritual work. And uh, I just wanted to conclude this session if you want to, to, to say a few words uh, before we finish. I, I just would like to thank you for all the efforts and all the... Also for me, because since we met, I have seen how you've come along and you've done so much for culture. And so you are also giving a lot. I mean, giving is not only, you know, like the time, the time that you have given for culture. I think for me, that is like a sadhana. And Sadhguru always teaches us, no matter what you do, do it with intensity, with passion and with love. And see everybody, you know, like once in one session, somebody says, Sadhguru, I love you. And he said, if you love me, love everything that comes across your life. Then you will be treated with so much more passion and with so much more dedication. And I think, Svetlana, you've been so dedicated since we, I left Geneva and you've done so much for the art and you've talked with so many people in 
opera with the music and theater and you know you have really really done what exactly you wanted to do so for me this is also very impressive and i will you know i raise my hat so i'm glad that we could make some difference i think when you're privileged you have responsibilities and uh, i wasn't born just to be somebody's mother somebody's wife and somebody's daughter i'm also here as a universal I mean, we all have universal responsibilities too. And even if you can do 10%, if you can improve ourselves 10% during, as Sadhguru says, just improve yourself 10% during this corona uh, uh, pandemic. You know, there are so much to learn for free of charges. All the museums have free access. You can do so much art history classes or languages or anything. I've been giving cooking, Persian cooking lessons to my friends online. So it's like the thing is, it's a choice. Either I'm going to be miserable and give up. I can't because I will, I'm, I'm, a, I'm living and I can't give up. I have to live and I have to live something positive and to do something positive for myself and my surrounding. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be with you and to share my ideas and what I'm doing. Well, Mojgan, it's honor. It's pleasure. It's always uh, immense um, uh, gratitude when I talk to you. I feel, uh, you know, this amazing uh, exchange of energy. And as you absolutely say, and I totally agree with you, you are the author of your life. It's up to you uh, what you do with it. We're all given a choice to decide what we do with our time with uh, what we have to deal with. And uh, it's never black and white, it's never easy, but uh, the spiritual work and constant work on yourself helps a lot to find good answers, uh, which will open new doors for you and make you look forward to the future. For now, we say thank you to Mojgan in Dubai. We hope to see you again. We will provide all the links so people can contact you and ask their questions and uh, maybe have their ideas or projects together. And thank you very much again, Morgan from Geneva. And thank you very much. Stay, to stay safe. I send, stay and I send you plenty of sunshine from Dubai. It's 39 degrees here. And hope everybody has a bright day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. We have interviews with other great guests on its way. To make this program fully beneficial and enjoyable for you, I invite you to become my co-creator. I announce in advance my next guests on my social media platforms. You can connect to a platform of your choice, write your questions, and don't forget to put your name and location. The most interesting questions will be asked during interviews on your behalf. You can also let me know who you want to see in our next editions. For now, stay safe, stay positive, and see you next time.